Okay, so uh, don't forget lab one is due tonight at midnight. Any any major issues with lab one? I've been talking to, yes? Uh, you know James about it, but uh, with the running the PSF, um, it Okay, so you're talking about the submission instructions, right? Okay, so um, yeah, we we have this. Uh, Charles, one of the guys that works in my lab, developed this tool to um, pack your 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 project in a form that you can upload it to Dropbox to Moodle, uh, because otherwise, if you just tar it, it's it's too big. Um, it also provides some. I think it provides some checking and makes sure you know ensures that you have all the stuff you're supposed to have for us to grade it. Um, so it. There's a file, praetor.psf. Uh, you have to download that, and uh, the easiest way to do that is just to, to download it to the same directory where your project is, right? And then there's a tomol file, which is uh, a metadata file that you also have to put there. If you click that link, it just shows you the text there, but if you do control S, I think you can just save it, right? Uh, or you can do a right click. I think it'd be easier. Do a right click on on the Tomo file, yeah, and say save as. Okay, so once you have both of those in there, um, the you have to make it executable. Yeah, the the, the well the pray the Praetor PSF and the Tomo file. The PSF file has to be uh, the Praetor dash PSF has to be executable. And so the way you do that is um, you would uh, you'd type. Hopefully, hopefully you guys covered this in um, uh, file permissions um, in 2.15, if you remember. It's a change mod, C-H-M-O-D, and then you want to do U plus X, and then Praetor dash, is it PSF? I don't remember. PSF, right. Right, yeah. Or I think you can actually, in, 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 um, in Ubuntu, if you right-click the file, I think you could do it there, too, in the GUI. Yeah, you don't have to do it. You could just right-click it and go to Properties and then check a box that says Executable. Uh, but then you have to drop back down to the GUI to run it. Um, and then you run it with the command uh, praetor-psf, dash, dash, create, dash, dash. In this case, Section 3. This would be whatever section you're in. Uh, the sections are listed here. Um, it says three here, and over here it says zero, zero, three, but it, it doesn't matter which one you use. We'll figure it out. It in fact, it doesn't matter that much at all because we know which section you're all in anyway by, based on your name. And then your group number. Now, the group number is a little tricky. I've got all the group numbers here. These are just arbitrary numbers that I assign to the groups. There's a few at the bottom that I don't have group numbers for. I haven't heard from them yet, but um, just look up your group number from, from the table. Yes. Oh, um, he meant he. It should be double dash. I don't know. The single dash must be a typo. Okay. So do both files have to be in the same file? Yes. Both of them? Yeah. Yeah. One's the program, and the other one's the tomo. Download the Tomo file. Oh yeah. If, <coughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. You actually don't have to put Praetor dash PSF in your project directory. You can put it in if you have a bin directory on your home directory. You, you can put it other places and, and run it from that other place. Does that make sense? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, were you here when I when I talked about the? Um, I think you came in right after th this command. The change change mod c h m o d u plus x space praetor dash p s f. That'll that'll give the file execute permission. You should be able to. That should fix the problem you're having. I uh, I'll add this to the instructions too. I forgot to to put that in. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Do we need to demo the project? 
Yes, yeah, you'll, uh, the, the TAs will approach you in lab and, and ask you to demo. The demo, it doesn't matter when you demo, you can demo, there's no rush because we're gonna use the date that you submitted it on Moodle as your submission time and date. So if you don't get to demo it this week, you know, maybe next week or the week after, um, that's okay. I, I mean, obviously sooner is better than later, but the TAs will prioritize questions about the current project over the demos. So, uh, but hopefully we'll get those demos done within the next. Sure, oh yeah. Sure, yeah, that works. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's no problem. Yeah, the demo is just gonna be a check off. They're gonna look for the functionality, make sure everything's working. Yes? On the, on the task where you had to, only the segment to go around clockwise, mm -hmm. does the lights have to go over at the same time at the bottom? Yeah, it should be at the same, the same timing, the same frequency. So the light, the light should, so should light up just as, as the segments go around? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, they, they should be going at the same time, that's right. Yeah, I sent, um, I posted a video on uh, YouTube. Did you guys see that, of, of it working? The, the video, um, I realized after I posted it, though, that the lights are going the wrong way around, right? They should be going clockwise. That was actually Charles's reference solution to the lab, and he did it, he did it wrong. <laughs> so it should, be going, it should be going clockwise. Okay, um, I think that's it for lab. One, yeah, any other questions? Oh, one more thing, yes. James, if you're still having trouble finishing lab one, James is going to be in the lab tonight from six to eight, right? Let me double check that. He posted a message about that. Uh, be holding additional office hours, 1D49, this evening from six to eight, yeah. Okay. All right, so moving along to the next part of the course. So right now we've got a processor and we have the LEDs and the hexes and the JTAG console are our output peripherals. And we've got the buttons as the input peripherals and the console. We wanna add an additional output peripheral now. We wanna add the ability to plug a monitor in and do video. So for this, we're gonna use the VGA connector on the DE2 board. VGA is, is a little, little old now. It was developed in the late uh, 1980s. It's been replaced now with HDMI and DisplayPort. Some of you guys might have never even seen one of these. Um, it's a 15-pin it's a connector, DB, DB15 connector. I don't know why the DE2s haven't updated yet to HDMI, but they're still using the old VGA. Um, so it's a 15 pin connector. On this board, I believe only five of the pins are connected. Five out of the 15 pins are connected. There's three analog pins that send a red, green, and blue signal and then there's two digital pins that send out a horizontal sync and a vertical sync. So the RGB is the color of the pixel, it sends out one pixel at a time, but analog, in analog. And then the, the two sync signals are used to tell the monitor what resolution you're sending the signal at. If the monitor doesn't support that resolution, it'll go to sleep, it'll, you'll see an amber light and it'll kinda just go into hibernate mode. Um, but the, um, the, the, the monitors we have in the lab um, don't have any problems um, with, with the default resolution the board puts out. Um, I put a timing diagram here just so you have an, I, I don't, it's not really that important to understand how VGA works. So this is the timing diagram. So you have this um, horizontal sync pulse it's active high, or sorry, active low. Uh, you have this pulse, and then there's a delay called the back porch. And then you send the pixels for a row, one row, one scan line. And then there's a delay called the front porch, and then another horizontal sync. And then those are packaged within a vertical sync signal for the frame. That's basically how it works. Uh, the pixel clock, so the, the, the resolution that we're gonna implement 
uh, in this lab to the monitors is 640 by 480. That's the signal that goes to the monitor. And so that requires a pixel clock of 25 megahertz because each individual pixel at that resolution and at 60 frames per second, 60 hertz, requires that you send a pixel every, and all, of course also including these overheads, these back porch and front porch when you don't get to send pixels. Considering all that, each pixel has to be sent out at a rate of 25 megahertz. So that's going to be the VGA clock. So I'll have to add a clock for that. So as I mentioned, it sends um, the signals out in analog. FPGAs are not analog, though. They don't have any analog inputs or output pins. Well, that's actually not true. There is, there is an FPGA called the Zinc that supports analog in and has an analog digital converter on board. But this FPGA that we're using does not. So the way we get around that is there is a digital to analog converter chip on the board. So the FPGA only has to put out an 8-bit red intensity, an 8-bit green intensity, and an 8-bit blue intensity signal in binary as 8-bit parallel signals, so eight wires for each of those. Those go out to the digital to analog converter and then they're translated to analog signals and sent over to the monitor across the VGA cable. There's also two digital signals in there. Those um, horizontal and vertical sync are just sent straight from the FPGA. They don't go through the, the, uh, the DAC, the digital analog converter. So the FPGA behaves the same way VGA does. It, 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 it behaves all the same timing that, you, that, the FP, that the VGA cable does. The only difference is it's sending out digital values for red, green, and blue. It sends those out in a raster order. So it sends out all the pixels from left to right of each scan line, of each row, starting from the top and then going down. And then it repeats and does the next frame. You guys with me? Make sense? Okay. So, so um, how do we... How would, then, how would we write code then to paint a picture, paint an image onto uh, the monitor? You do that using a frame buffer. So there's a, there's a memory on, on, the, uh, on the system, in the system called the frame buffer. It's allocated to the frame buffer. And the frame buffer contains a, an image of what's being displayed on the screen. And then you have an external, uh, you have this um, hardware that continuously reads the frame buffer over and over and over again and just sends all the pixels in the frame buffer out to the VGA. And that, that, that's happening concurrently. That's a separate, you think of that as your video card, right? That's happening separately from the software. Then the software, the software you write, only needs to write into the frame buffer and whatever it writes will within a 60th of a second, within a frame time, be sent out to the screen, right? So in other words, you write to an array and those writes that you, that you make to that array are, are seen right away on the screen. They're reflected on the monitor that's attached. Does that make sense? Okay. So the frame buffer, um, the, the frame buffer uh, in our case is actually going to be a, a smaller resolution than what's on the screen, and then we're going to use a scaler in the hardware to scale it up. And you, and you might say, well, why is that? Well, originally it was because we didn't have enough memory on the old boards. We didn't have enough memory to, to, to have a frame buffer that contains a 640 by 480 frame. Uh, and now, but now we do, so that's not a problem. But when you guys first start doing this, this second lab, the software is going to be so slow, the initial version of your software will be so slow that it will actually be painful waiting for it to paint all the pixels of a 640 by 480. So we're going to start out using a lower resolution. So the frame buffer is going to be 320 by 240 and each pixel is 24 bits or 3 bytes. So if you multiply that out, 320 by 240 by 3, you get 225 kilobytes. So that's the size of the frame buffer. You guys with me? All right. 
Okay, so the frame buffer itself is, you have a couple options of how you can lay that out. We're going to use consecutive addressing, which means that the frame buffer, you think of it as a two-dimensional array. It's got, it's got um, well, in this case, I'm showing the full resolution, 480 rows, or in our, in our smaller case, it'll have 240 rows. And then it'll have 640 columns, or in our reduced case, it'll have 320 columns, right? And each one of those, each one of those uh, cells in there is a pixel that is three bytes. The memory is laid out to where when you get to the last pixel of the first row, the next location in memory is the first pixel of the next row. You guys with me? So you're taking a two-dimensional array and you're superimposing it onto a one-dimensional memory. Memory, computer memory is, all, is, is inherently 1D. You give an address and there's, there's the contents of that address. But the frame buffer is 2D, so you have to take the two-dimensional structure and sort of flatten it out into a one-dimensional array and, and the consecutive addressing is what defines that, right? So what that means is that if I have a, if I give you a, a row and a column, with a coordinate, a pixel coordinate, I say, well, I want row, row two, column three, I want this pixel, how do I translate that into a one-dimensional index for the frame buffer? Well, you take the row number, which is Y, you multiply that by the size of the row, which is 640 or 320, whatever your row size is, and you add the column, or X, to that. Make sense? So every time I access this thing, I have to do a multiply and an add in order to translate the row and column to an index in the frame buffer. Is yes? from the base address? Or which, what, what yes, then you, you would add that to the base address. That's right, yeah. Yeah, to the starting, base address being the starting address of the frame buffer, yeah. Make sense? Um, something else I wanted to mention about that. Um, there's also X, Y addressing sometimes people use, which is, um, it's very similar, except in that case, you're taking the row size and you're rounding it up to the next power of two. So if I have 640 columns, I'll just round that up to 1,024, which is the next closest power of two. That way, I waste all of the, I waste all these pixels between 2, 640 all the way up to 1023. I just waste them. But the advantage of that is, is then my address no longer, doing the addressing doesn't require a multiply. I just take which row and I shift that 10 bits to the left and then I just OR in the column address. In other words, you take the row and the column and you just concatenate them together and you get the address. So that's the advantage, but again, that, that wastes memory and we're going to use the consecutive um, addressing. Oh, I remember, um, um, keep in mind that I sometimes use X and Y and row and column interchangeably, right? Row is vertical, column is horizontal, right? X and Y refers to like in a Cartesian plot, X is the horizontal and Y is the vertical. But the problem is, is that row comes before column. You generally say row and column, but the row corresponds to Y and the column corresponds to X. You guys with me? So don't let that confuse you, right? If you say X and Y, Y is the vertical, that's the row, and X is the horizontal, that's the column. Okay. okay. Um, now, the other, the, other, the other small detail to this is that if you're using 24-bit color where each pixel is comprised of an 8-bit red, an 8-bit green, and an 8-bit blue component, those arrays are usually conceptualized as an array of bytes. Right, Be and the reason for that, by the way, is just because eight, eight, and eight is twenty-four, and twenty-four bit is, is does not match up to any kind of data type. There's no kind of there's no such thing as a twenty-four bit number. So, generally speaking, if you have a twenty-four bit pixel depth, then you treat the frame buffer 
as an array of bytes, in which case it really becomes a three-dimensional array, where you have the row, the column, and then you have a third dimension that is which of the three color channels you want. You guys with me? So it complicates things a bit because if you want, for instance, this, this pixel, but you want the green channel out of it, then the way you calculate it is you have to take the row and you multiply it by the row size, right, which is actually the number of columns times three, and then you add the column number times three plus the color channel, which is zero, one, or two for red, green, or blue. You guys with me? So in that case, you're just, you're treating it like a three-dimensional array. Okay, so, um, so how do we set up the hardware? Uh, I'll go through this, um, I'll go through this live to show you how to do it. But just to give you an idea of what we're doing, what we're adding here, uh, we're going to add a, we got our CPU, and we're going to add a, a new peripheral for the SRAM interface. So the, the board has DRAM, which is where we're storing our program, but it has SRAM, which is what we're going to associate with our video memory, our frame buffer. So you could think of the DRAM as being our main core RAM, and the SRAM is going to be our video RAM, like our video card RAM, our VRAM, right? Now, in principle, I should be able to put everything in one RAM. Um, but we're going to separate it out because if you put everything in one RAM, you're, you're going to have the, you're going to be sharing the DRAM between the program, your, your processor, you know, program code, and the frame buffer. So we're going to keep them separate. You guys with me on that? It'll be a lot slower too. If you yeah, because there'll be contention. Yeah, in fact, we've, we've seen that happen. Um, we may end up combining them later in the semester, but for now we're going to keep them separate, two separate memories. So we have to add an SRAM interface. Have you heard, you guys know the difference between DRAM and SRAM? So DRAM is, is a, most computer memory is, is DRAM. Uh, the reason is DRAM is, is manufactured in a capacitive process. So every bit in a DRAM memory is a capacitor, and therefore you only need one transistor per bit, uh, the, the one transistor per bit that, that allows you to connect or disconnect that capacitor, right? So it's very dense. SRAM is not made in a capacitive process, it's made in a CMOS process. And, and therefore it requires six transistors per bit because you have to make a cross-coupled uh, inverters, two inverters facing each other. Um, so SRAM is less dense, but the advantage is, is that uh, it's faster. You can access it faster um, and you can integrate it in, in with logic. You can mix it with logic. So that way, like your cache, the cache that's on a, a CPU is made with SRAM, but the main system core memory is made in DRAM. It makes sense? And by the way, when I say faster, what I mean by faster is it's faster to access something from SRAM. The time it takes from when I request it to the time I finish the operation, the read or write operation. The bandwidth isn't necessarily any better. The, the rate at which data comes out is about the same. In fact, sometimes DRAM has an advantage over SRAM when it comes to bandwidth, the rate at which I can dump pool data out of it. But access time is better with SRAM, right? Um, now you might say, well, why do we care about latency if we're doing a video buffer? We don't. We're just using them as two separate memories. Okay? So we're going to add an SRAM interface. Um, you'll notice that the SRAM interface is much simpler than DRAM. It's easier to use SRAM, so there's not as many settings in there. Um, okay, now here's where things get weird. I mentioned that most things in the system so far are based around the concept that the NEOS processor is the master and it controls everything. It coordinates everything. Nothing gets done without the NEOS initiating it because it's the master, the bus master of everything. Now we're going to add this thing called this pixel buffer for DMA. It's a DMA controller. And DMA controllers can also be bus masters. And the reason is that, that you want, what you want the DMA to do, the DMA is going to be the master of the SRAM, as is the NEOS. But the DMA is going to be using its master connection to load the pixels, to read the pixels out of the frame buffer over and over and over again in an endless loop. Just read, read, just keeps reading them, reading them, reading them. And then it converts those pixels into a stream, an Avalon stream. What's a stream? A stream is 
a stream has no address. It's just, it's like a fire hose of data. It's just data that comes with no address associated with it. Just one data element after another. And it's going to be sending that to this RGB resampler that'll convert from 24-bit color to 30 color because for some reason, and I don't completely understand why, I think they just never updated it, the, the, the university program cores require 30-bit color, not 24-bit color. I don't, it's a weird non-standard pixel depth, but we have to convert from 24 to 30. Once we do that, we continue sending the stream into the scaler, which will convert the resolution from 320 to 240 as stored in our frame buffer into 640 by 480 that we want to send out to the VGA. And that's simple, right? That's just a, that's a very simple operation. Basically, every one of our pixels will correspond to a block of two by two pixels when we send out to the monitor. You guys, make sense? Right? So the image is 320 by 240, but if you go to your monitor settings, if you look at the monitor settings, the monitor will say that it's receiving a 640 by 480 signal. So don't let that confuse you. That's true. We're going to use the, resamp the scaler to, to reconcile that difference. Then we need a dual clock FIFO because we have, to get, we have to get the pixels coming in at our 50 megahertz clock have to cross clock domains into our 25 megahertz clock. So we're going to be sending pixels in on a 50 megahertz clock and we're going to be reading them out at a 25 megahertz clock. You might say, wait a second, wait, well hold, if you do that, you're just going to overfill the FIFO because you're going to be sending stuff in the FIFO faster than you take it out. You're just going to overfill it. Yes, that would be true, except that that pixel buffer for DMA is smart enough not to do that. It's only going to send one pixel every other cycle to avoid that. You guys with me? but you still need the dual clock FIFO to reconcile the, uh, the difference in clocks. Uh, and then we go out to the VGA controller. Now, what is significant about this? All of this stuff here happens without the CPU's involvement. So that's all kind of autonomous. It's all happening without the CPU having to worry about it. So this way, the CPU, once you've got that hardware set up, the CPU only has to write, pixel, write pixels into the frame buffer and they will automatically be conveyed out when the time is right to the monitor. So this is essentially a video card. Think of it, you guys, if you guys ever built a computer, you put a, you know, a separate video a device in there, that's what this is doing. It's, it's, it's kind of its own thing going on concurrently with your software and with the NEOS processor. Um, and that's it. We just have to add one component for each of those and the trick, of course, is to hook them all up right in, in Platform Designer. Uh, once we have this set up, we'll have a base system that we're going to use for all the other labs in this class because this everything we do is going to be video related from here on out. Um, there's uh, we have to add another clock module to generate that 25 megahertz clock, and we're going to need to have we're going to add an interval timer, which will allow us to we need a clock. We need a way for the NEOS processor to understand time. And right now, there's no way to, to look, there's, there's no real-time clock on this, on this board like you have in a regular computer. So we're going to add this interval timer to get that functionality. That's going to allow us to measure how many frames per second your code is achieving. You guys with me? Now, just, let me clarify that too, by the way. The DMA, this DMA thing is sending out 60 frames per second always. But your CPU is probably not going to be fast enough to generate a new frame every 60th of a second. In fact, it's going to be way slower than that. So we're going to be measuring the achieved performance of your code in terms of frames per second in terms of how fast it can update the whole frame buffer. You guys with me? Even though the hardware is still sending out frames every 60th of a second, but obviously if your CPU is slower than that, which it will be, it's going to be sending multiple frames that are the same thing over and over again for a while, right? You guys with me? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So these are all the settings. Um, I will, I just have this here so you can reference this when you're building your stuff. And finally, the Verilog modifications uh, are going to the, uh, involve you having to add the VGA and the SRAM pins, right? So you can just copy and paste that. This is going to go on your module. So you're going to add these to the end of your module statement and you'll add these to the end of your NEO system instantiation. Any questions about that? <clears throat> and one thing you'll notice, by the way, is 
you see the RGB signals and you see the vertical and horizontal sync and the clock, but what are these blank and there's these blank, VGA blank and VGA sync? VGA blank is, does not go to the monitor, it only goes to the chipset. What that does is if the blank signal is asserted, it will disable the DAC. And the reason for that is because according to the VGA spec, during the back porch and the front porch, which are just these times, you're not supposed to send any analog signal to the monitor. Not allowed. But that was from the days of cathode ray tubes. And it turns out, even if you do that with the digital monitors that we use today, the flat panel, the flat screens, the LCD screens, they don't care. They're fine with it. But back in the day, you had to disengage the analog signals, the RGB signals. In other words, make them float, you know, turn them off. And that's what the blank does. So it's not really, it, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't really affect us too much. Yes? Kind of side question, like the, oh, the new versions of the monitors, like OLED, what's hmm? the well, that's just the, 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 the way that they generate the colors on the screen, but the, the signaling standard, you know, when you get the data from the computer to the monitor, that's still the same. You can still use VGA for those, mostly, or DisplayPort or HDMI. Yeah, the reason, one of the reasons that I think they don't support HDMI yet is the, the HDMI is a gigahertz class. HDMI doesn't have eight bit, you know, this thing has eight bits for red, eight bits for green, eight bits for blue. HDMI also has red, green, and blue, except instead of having eight separate wires, there's one wire. And thus you have to run it eight times faster. And so running that eight times faster pushes you up. Now in this case, it wouldn't matter because if you're at six, 640 by 480, it's a 25 megahertz clock. So eight times 25 isn't that big of a deal. But if you have higher resolution and you multiply by eight, like if you get to 1080p, that's going to get you up into the gigahertz range. And this FPGA can't, this FPGA can't do gigahertz signaling. A bigger FPGA can, but ours doesn't. So you would have to have a separate HDMI chip, and those are expensive, so they didn't put them on the board, <laughs> basically. Okay, so, um, all right, settings, Verilog. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, these are the settings for the, uh, th there's a modification of the BSP editor. I'll show you this. Okay. Uh, Okay, and this is the other thing I mentioned too. Um, the oh, let me let me step back here a minute. So there is a so the 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 question now is what are we actually doing with the video? What are we gonna what are we what is your code gonna write to the frame buffer? What's it what's it what's it gonna paint? Um, if you're doing so, sometimes you can algorithmically generate pixels, like if you're doing 3D rasterization or vector graphics or fractal generation, which we'll do at the end of the semester, the, 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 the CPU doesn't really need any graphics. To, it, it generates its own graphics, in other words. But in, in this lab, our goal is going gonna, is gonna to be to take an existing image and transform it. We're going to warp it. Well, we're going to rotate it. We're going to write code that rotates an image that takes an existing image, but we have to get an existing image in the FPGA. That's the challenge. How do we do that? Well, we've, we've done this different ways over the years. And up until this semester, we were using the flash memory. We were, there's a flash memory chip on this board that you can write stuff into and treat it like a fake hard drive, like a disk. It has a, it has a file system on it. But the problem with that is that it's a lot of stuff you got to do to set that up, and there's no payoff. It's like you set all this stuff up, and then that's it. You know, nothing comes of that. So this semester, I, I'm trying something different. I'm going to try to simplify this a bit. I have this script called convert image to C file. It is a MATLAB script, but you can run it in Octave, which is the free Mat MATLAB that's on all the machines in the lab. And I could have wrote it in Python, too. It's just I don't know Python. It would have been just as easy to, to do it in Python. Um, but it will take, it'll take an image, any image you want, any, for, any of the popular, you know, JPEG, ping, bitmap, whatever, GIF. It'll read that in and then it will, if it will convert it to the size needed for the frame buffer, for your frame buffer, 320 by 240. It'll convert it to three. Now the question is, 
If it's too big, it scales it down. It uses MATLAB's resizer, right? Built-in resizing function. But if, it's, if the aspect ratio is off, because 320 by 240 is a 4-3 aspect ratio, the width is 4 thirds times the height, if you give it something that doesn't obey that, then it will add a letter box. It'll add blank pixels either to the sides or the top or bottom as necessary. At least that's what it should be doing. If you have any trouble with it, let me know. All right. So it'll adapt any image for you. But I, I have a, an example image uh, on, the, on Moodle that you can use if you want to be safe. And it's, it's exactly 320 by 240. It's a little cartoon cat most people use. But you can get any image you want. Um, Anyway, you run this script on an image, you just give it the file name, and it will generate a myfile.c and myfile.h, which are just two additional source code files, and then you have to run a command, neos2 apt update make file, add source files, and just add myfile.c. You would run this command in your, your, your top level software lights directory and it'll add that file. So basically, it's pretty cool. It converts an image file to a C file. How's it do that? It just, it just creates a global variable and then it initializes it in C code, right? I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> um, the problem, of course, is that it's a big array and so it, it's gonna make the compile time and the download, ELF download time a little higher. But I think it's a good trade-off because otherwise there's a ton of other stuff, hoops you got to jump through to make this make this work. This is, I think this is, but if you run, like I said, if you're in any trouble, let me or the, one of the TAs know. Um, uh, so anyway, um, okay, anything else I want to say? Um, so once you have that in there, it will create something called my image, which will be a global variable. So you can reference that thing anywhere in your software as long as you include the header file, myfile.h. And then you would then address it as a one-dimensional array. And uh, so if I want to say pixel, I want to go to row 100 and column 200, then I would say 100 times 320 times 3 plus 200 times 3 plus 0 for red plus 1 for green and plus 2 for blue. Make sense? So. Now you might say, wait a second, hold on. What, does C not have multi-dimensional arrays? Yeah, it, uh, it does. It does have multi-dimensional arrays, but we just, we collapsed everything into a one-dimensional array so it matches the same layout as the frame buffer. Make sense? Yeah, C does have multi-dimensional, but this is, this is, um, you know, like I said, it flattens, this, this is a way to flatten the three-dimensional array into one dimension. Any questions? Okay. All right, so these are the header files you have to add. Uh, there's standard I.O., which you already have. That was required for the print. Standard lib is required for... Uh, it's for malloc, but we're not using malloc anymore. Hmm. I forget what we need that for. I may, might not need that. I don't remember exactly what we're using that's going to require that, but it can't hurt to add it. Um, then there's Altera UP Avalon Video Pixel Buffer DMA.h. That is the how, the driver, the driver code for the pixel buffer, right? So that, that's how you're going to communicate with the pixel buffer. Math.h we're going to need for some trig functions that we need for the transformation. And then AltAlarm.h is what we're going to use to access that interval timer that I told you about adding. And then myfile.h is the one that, that my MATLAB script generates that will allow you to access the image. Okay. All right, so the pixel buffer is very simple. Um, you have to set it up though for, so in the software. So you declare an alt up pixel buffer DMA dev star my pixel buffer. That's the handle to the pixel buffer. It's a device handle. Uh, by the way, th you might say, what, why, why do you need that? This is the way that you would, if you were writing this in an object-oriented language, you would just declare an object of type pixel buffer, and then there would be methods of that object that allow you to paint pixels, right? But we're not using C++, we're using C, and so this is generally how, you, how things work in a non-object-oriented language. Instead of having an object, you have a pointer that points to something, 
So you declare the pointer and then you open, you open the device for the pixel buffer and you assign the output of that, the return value to the, to the handle. So the pointer essentially puts the address in the memory basically. Right. Yeah, so what'll happen is this alt up pixel buffer DMA open device will, will create, will allocate the memory to hold all the information about the pixel buffer and then it will return a pointer to that and you get it in this pixel buffer, right? And then from now on, every time you talk to the pixel buffer, you just send in that as the first parameter, just like right here, right? So every time, so in other words, you know, if this was a C++ or Java, you would just say my pixel buffer dot paint, but we don't have that in, in here, so we, we say paint and then my pixel buffer as the first argument, right? So it's pretty simple you know, equivalence to, to uh, C++ and Java. Uh, so to clear the screen, you just say clear screen, my pixel buffer, and then the, the color that you want to clear it with is zero. And then if you want to draw a pixel, you just say draw my pixel buffer. Now in this case, the, f the, the first thing, the, the second thing you send in after the my pixel buffer is the color, right? Now I mentioned that the frame buffer is organized as an array of bytes where every byte is the color channel. Right? But when you call this draw, you have to take all three colors and put them together into one value, right? as opposed to sending R, G, and B separately. Why is it like this? I, I, I don't know. I think it would have been easier if they just had three parameters for red, green, and blue. But they don't. You have to combine them yourself. But it's easy to do. You just take the red, the green, and the blue elements from the array and you just add them. Right? But before you add them, you have to make sure that the, the, um, the, you have to shift by the number of bits for each color channel, so 8 and 16. The reason I paused there is I thought that the red was, I thought that was red and that should be 16. I guess, I guess um, the plus 2 must be the blue because you don't shift it. The plus 1 here is the green, you shift it by 8, and the plus 0 is the is the red, and you shift it by 16. The red is the most significant byte, uh, but yet it's the least significant in terms of this um, index, right? But, it, you know, if you have to switch them, you can just switch those, you know, the 16 and the 0. You guys all follow that? That makes sense? Okay. Oh, and then, uh, sorry, I, I didn't finish that. And then the last two parameters are X and Y. But remember I mentioned that X is the column and Y is the row. So notice I have J and I because normally when you write a 2D, you know, a nested loop, it, I is the outer loop, it's the row, J is the inner loop, it's the column. So I used J and I here. Um, the reason it's J and I, not I and J, is because X and Y are in the opposite order, row and column. You guys with me? But this is just an example. And by the way, the, um, there's a link on Moodle with the documentation for these calls. It's, it's under, in fact, let me show you. It's under the, there's a link um, called Video IP Course for Intel DE Series Boards, and all the details are in here. In fact, you can see I got that figure from there. Um, there's a lot of information here you can, you can use if you have any questions. <coughs> Oh, by the way, this is the example image too. This is um, a picture that, that uh, we often use in this class. It's this little, it doesn't look like it's um, a four-third aspect ratio, but it is. It, it just has a black, it, it, it's, it's hard to see, but it's got black bars on the left and right-hand side. <clears throat> the reason we use this picture, by the way, is because it's simple. It's only got a few different unique colors in it, so it it's, makes it easy to debug when something goes wrong but you can use whatever, whatever image you want. And the script, by the way, that I was referring to is here. This is the MATLAB script. Um, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, um, but basically, it, um, you know, it, it adds the letter box and resizes, and then it just has a function at the bottom down here called write code that generates the necessary code for you. So if, if, if you're interested, it's not too hard to, to figure, figure out what's going on in there. Okay, any questions? All right, good. So let's go ahead and get into the um, 
platform designer. So I opened up the project that I that I that I uh, stopped with uh, last class, and this is the basic design that you started with for Lab One. So we've got the um, the clock port, the processor, the PLL generates the the, the sys clock and the SD RAM clock, <clears throat> the little other clock pin here, the SD RAM controller, and then um, the UR, the LEDs, and the keys. And of course, you guys in your designs, you have the additional outputs for the hex displays, right? Hex zero through seven. So if we want to add video, the first thing we need to do is add the SRAM. Actually, I'm going to add the uh, clocks. If you search for clocks, this is the one that we already have, the system and SD RAM clock. So now we want to add the video clocks. And we don't need the video in clock. We don't need the LCD clock. We just need the VGA clock. And the resolution there that we'll use is 640 by 480. So I hit finish. And then we want to add the SRAM. SRAM controller. This is part, this is also part of the university program. All you have to do is specify which board we're using, DE2115. And it has a check mark option for uses a pixel buffer for video out. And you know, that's what we're going to use it for. So turn that on. And then uh, we need the pixel buffer for DMA, pixel buffer DMA controller, also part of the university program. Addressing mode will be consecutive. And the frame resolution will be 320 by 240. Make sure you change those. <coughs> Color space is 24-bit RGB. Now, the, uh, the option I didn't set is really important, but I can't set it yet. Oh, actually, I can. Um, let me hit finish for now. Uh, are my addresses, okay, so I was checking to see if I need to reassign my addresses. The SRAM, um, see it didn't give, let's see, maybe let me connect the SRAM clock to sys clock. I'm looking for a base address here. Uh, oh, I need to connect the slave port to the data master here. All right, and then of course the I need to put my conduit here for the external signals. Uh, uh, or sorry, the uh, yeah SRAM. We call this SRAM. Okay, so once I connected the SRAM controller to the processor, notice I now have a base address and it, it it's zero, which is good. In fact, we want it to we want to keep that at zero. So in order to make sure it stays at zero. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but there's a little lock. There's like a little padlock icon there. Click that padlock on to make sure that that never gets changed. And now if you go back to the pixel buffer, you see where it says default buffer start address and default back buffer start address. We're going to leave those at zero because those have to match up to the address of the SRAM. That's how we're, that's how we're going to tell the pixel buffer that it's going to use the SRAM as the video memory. You guys with me? That's, that's um, if, if you don't have that um, set, you can change it in the software, uh, but it's a lot easier if you just have it set up initially in the hardware and you don't have to worry about it. We uh, will also have to make sure that uh, this guy gets the system clock. So I'll set up his clock. Reset will be the same reset we use for everything else. The um, this uh, slave Avalon control slave will be again the data master, and then this thing is a master port. Now remember, what master just means that you can initiate a load or store or read or write operation on another memory. So we want to connect his port up to the SRAM slave port. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, you already connected that to the you already connected that to the, the processor. Yeah, you can, have, you can have multiple masters. They have to go through a crossbar switch, so the more you do that, the more hardware uh, resources it uses, but, but you know, two is no problem. So uh, let's see, I click on the master and I click that over here to the SRAM and connect it. You guys all see that now? So there's the slave 
if I, if I click that, I can see it highlights this wire and it highlights one from above, too, coming from the CPU. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, so far so good. Now I need to add some downstream, so downstream components. So the, the DMA controller is generating a stream. See, it says pixel source there. So the first downstream component is the uh, resampler. So I say resampler, RGB resampler. We're going to go from 24 bit input to 30 bit output, connect its clock to sysclock, connect its reset to the global reset, connect its sync to the source from above. and connect the slave here to the data master on the CPU. Not that we ever use that. Okay, next is the uh, rescaler. Rescaler or scaler? I guess it's just scaler. Scaler. All right, double click that. We're gonna scale, our scale factor is gonna be two in height and two in width. And the incoming frame, this is something that, that uh, groups often forget. Make sure you set this to 320 by 240 for the incoming frame. The um, data bits per symbol is now 10 because we had the, this is, this is downstream of the, resample, uh, the RGB resampler. So this is actually 10 bits per, per symbol, three symbols per beat. Hit OK there. Connect the clock again to sysclock. Reset to the global reset. And then the sync is going to take the source from the guy above it right there. So I hit that little bubble there. <coughs> okay, and then uh, next we have the dual clock FIFO. Dual clock, add that. Color bits 10, color planes 3. Okay, the clock in is going to be sys clock, but the clock out is going to be the VGA clock, the new one that we added. Reset is the global reset, and the reset stream out, I'm just, uh, for that I'm going to use, let's see, video, we have a reset coming from the, the video PLL reset source, I'll use that. And then uh, sync is going to be the source from the guy above it, so you connect that. So you guys all see how that 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 chain of, of thing that we're forming a chain of these um, modules through this stream, and then finally VGA controller. Whoops, uh, there we go. VGA controller. Double click that. D series. Oh, D ten. Holy cow. Um, DE2 115, uh, video out uh, VGA connector, vi resolution 640 by 480, hit finish on there. And then again, the clock is now VGA clock. So the only two uses of VGA clock here, by the way, oh, wait a second, it changed the other one. This guy should be VGA clock too. Why did it change that? It's because the reset, I guess. Okay, so the dual clock FIFO, dual clock buffer, dual clock FIFO. Incoming clock, sys clock, outgoing clock, VGA clock, and then the VGA controller also gets VGA clock. Those are the only two things on the VGA clock in here, internally. Um, and then the uh, sync is going to be, oh, uh, sorry, I screwed that up. The sync will be whatever the source is from this guy above it. And then the external interface is my conduit. I'm going to say VGA, that'll add the pins that I connect to the pins on the FPGA. It'll, it'll add the pins of the NEO system, which I will then connect to the top level pins on the FPGA through the wrapper. Everyone with me? Good, okay. Um, and then I think, let's see, what else? Just the, um, we need the interval timer. Interval timer, interval timer. Interval timer. Okay, now this, the way this thing works is you set up a period and after, after each period it interrupts the NEOS processor 
and it sets the BSP has an interrupt service routine in there that will increment a global variable called n ticks. So every time this thing goes, it's going to increment a tick, a tick counter on the Avalon. And then your software can just check the number of ticks. It knows how much time has passed, right? It's pretty cool. The problem is, is that I made the mistake over the weekend because I forgot about this. If, if you set this to one microsecond and you try to run it, the whole system will lock up. It never even gets to the main function. And the reason is, is because one microsecond interrupts the NEOS processor so much, so fast, that it never gets any time to do anything else. What is one microsecond? How many s clock cycles is that? Well, that's um, 50 megahertz is 20 nanoseconds. And how many 20 nanosecond clocks can you fit in a microsecond? Well, 50. 50 clocks. So that means that if that's one microsecond, every 50 clock cycles, it's going to interrupt the NEOS processor and it won't be able to do anything else. It'll just be continued. That's called, that condition, by the way, is called live lock. That's the way that back in the day, guys used to bring down big websites like Amazon because you'd hit them with a denial of service attack. You'd, you'd send so many packets that, and every time a packet is received, there's an interrupt that triggers and it prevents the computer, the server, from doing anything with service interrupts. So it was pretty simple. You just hit Amazon with a sin flood and goodbye. Um, now, if, there's, there's ways that they, they protect against that now. But it's the same idea here. It, it, this thing will, will keep it into a live lock state. So instead of that, let's do 100 microseconds instead. Now, obviously, the trade-off here is that if my tick counter is only going up every 100 microseconds, the granularity of my ability to tell time is going to be is going to go down by a factor of 100. I'm going to lose timing resolution. But that's OK, because I'm measuring frames per second. And how often does a frame, wh what's the frame time of a typical video? Well, 60th of a second, 60 frames per second? That's 16 milliseconds, right? Or if you have a video, a 30 frames per second, like if you watch a movie, that's 30 milliseconds. So even if your code was getting 30 frames per second, which I'll tell you right now, you're not going to get anywhere near that. That still is going to give us, um, what, 30 ticks or so. Actually, no, um, 300 ticks, right? Make sense? Okay, so that's, we'll just use 100 microseconds. But keep that in mind. Um, uh, okay, finish on that. And we'll set up the clock as sys clock. Reset is our global reset. I can use that reset there too, right? And that, right? Yeah, there we go. And there? Yeah, I got all my resets now on this. This thing's got, yeah, I got everything on that reset. Okay, good. Um, this will be Data Master. And the IRQ, have to connect this or it won't work. So make sure you connect this IRQ. There's only one place to connect it because we only have one processor. So I'll connect the IRQ there. You guys, you guys hopefully covered IRQ interrupts in, um, in operating systems 3.11. If you guys, oh, okay, yeah, you might be taking it. Yeah, it's, it's interrupts are, are used whenever you have an ace, something that can, that, that can happen externally in, in unpre unpredictable times, like, you know, network packets or yeah, like, like this. The interrupt vector is where the processor, how it responds to an interrupt. So the vector tells it where to go. And you guys set that up already. Um, in fact, I can show you that. If you go into your processor settings, double click on the processor, the interrupt vector is right there. The, well, they call it the exception vector. But um, basically, if you hit the reset button, it goes to address 0. And if, and if an interrupt happens, it goes to address 20. Right. OK, uh, I think we're all set. Um, but I have some errors down here complaining about overlapping addresses. So I can fix that. I just say assign base addresses. That should clear those off. Um, let's see. I've got video PLL reference clock must be connected to a clock output. Uh, that's talking. Ah, yes. Sorry. The PLL. I forgot about this. Um, the video PLL. I forgot to make a connection to the reference clock. You guys remember that... Um, 
where's the reference, right here? Yeah. Yeah, the video takes the, the clock from the crystal, it's a 50 megahertz clock, and it's going to convert it to a 25 megahertz clock. All right, and uh, let's see, video PLL, the reset must be connected, that's no problem, I'll just connect the reset there. Uh, the reset is connected to the, the button on the board, and the SRAM reset, apparently I forgot to connect that. Um, no, I didn't. It's connected. Oh, that's keys. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm on, I'm on keys. There's reset. Yeah, sorry. I forgot that. You see there's no connection there. Click that on. There we go. All right. We're all set. Generate HDL. Generate. Saves it. And... Now it's generating. All right, great. All right, so if I go to the software now, <clears throat> so I need a source, uh, share, reconfig, CAD set of files, I'll tear it out, bash, and then I'll go to data designs, lights. Is this lights or lights VGA? This is lights. Lights, software, lights, BSP. So I'm going to go to my BSP directory because I want to point this out. If you go to the drivers subdirectory, the, oops, sorry, then include. Okay, so the only drivers I currently have are the JTAG UART file descriptor, JTAG UART, JTAG UART regs, and parallel I.O. regs. So I don't have any driver for my, my pixel buffer yet. I have to go and generate the BSP again for that, right? So if I come up two levels, I can type Neos2 BSP generate files, dash dash settings. This is kind of inconvenient to type all this stuff, but you'll, you'll get used to it. Um, BSP dash dir is dot, right? I get that right? I think so. Yeah, there it goes. So now it's regenerating the BSP based on the new hardware I added. And I can verify that now if I go back to the drivers include directory, I should have, oh, there it is. I've got a bunch of new stuff in there now. I've got video pixel buffer dma.h, RGB resampler. I don't know why you would have to talk to the resampler from software. I've never done that before. I guess you could change the resampling mode on the fly. Never, never done that before. Timer, and then we got the timer. So I can talk to the timer, right? Um, now, this is also kind of complex, too, because part of this BSP now is going to set up the interrupt handler for the timer. You guys don't have to worry about that, though. You don't have to do anything, because that's going to be happening in the background. So when you run your code, that interrupt is going to be going every 100 microseconds, and it's going to be maintaining that counter, but you will never, you probably will never even see that unless you're in the debugger. If you're in the debugger and you freeze the program when you're in the debugger, you might notice every once in a while that when you do that, you might coincidentally not be where you thought you were. You might be in the interrupt service routine, right? But the odds of that happening are very slim because the total time it spends in there is going to be, it should be pretty small, right? I hope so. Otherwise, it's going to affect your performance. It's going to slow everything down if it's spending too much time in that interrupt handler, right? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and then one final thing you need to do, and, um, and this is what actually sets up that interrupt handler I was just talking about. Uh, if you go to Neos2 BSP settings, settings, um, I got that right, BSP editor, sorry, editor, BSP editor. You click, you go to that and it's going to bring up a GUI. We, we, we actually had to do this to set up the UART, right, as the output device, the console. This uh, will allow you to specify that interval timer as your, uh, I don't know if it's going to, oh, finished generating. Um, um, I don't think I'm getting it up here, but that, that's fine. Uh, if you go to the, um, in the, 
in the slides, this is what it looks like. There's, there's a thing right on, the, right on the front. When you open that BSP editor, right on the front page, right on the, right on the first tab, um, you want to set up the system clock timer to be timer zero. Timer zero is the name of that interval timer. And that's the thing that'll set up the interrupt for you. That'll, that'll keep that count going. Okay? Um, and that's, that's it. And then you can start just modifying your hello world to, to implement lab two. So what do we want to do in lab two? Well, as I mentioned, we want to be able to take an image, which you'll get through my script. It'll basically just add the image as a C file into your project that will become a global variable. And you'll have that, that data, those pixels there. The simplest thing to do is to just take that image and write it to the pixel buffer. So you can write a 4i equals 0, i is less than 240. For j equals 0, j is less than 320. So for every row, for every column, then you just say print the pixel using the, the, the code that I gave you verbatim, this code, this line. Just put that in a 4i, 4j loop and that'll take the, the picture, whatever picture you put in there, and it should put it out on the monitor. So then you take your board, you plug your board into the monitor. Down in the lab, we've got a separate monitor just for the boards. There's, a dual, there's two monitors. You plug one of the monitors in the board, and hopefully it'll, you run your program and it should, it should show the image. But that's not exciting. We, we want to actually do something with the image that's you know, non-trivial. So um, the, easiest, the easiest thing to do is to transform it. <coughs> so if you take each of the pixel locations, row and column, or X and Y, however you want to think of it, or I should say Y and X, uh, you can run each one of those through a transformation matrix. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty easy. You just say you have the row and the column, the original row and column, and you just put them through these two equations. And you get the new row and column, which is shown as row prime, column prime. So you got the old, the original location, and the new location. And then you've got theta, which is the angle at which you want to rotate it. And all you got to do, well, conceptually anyway, is go through all of the rows and columns, run them through this transformation equation, these two equations, come up with new row and columns, and then move the pixel to the new location. That will actually do the rotation for you. These are really cool, by the way. You can do lots of neat things with these image rotate, these, there's more complicated ones than this, but you can like, you know, you could take your, your image and you can, you know, like put it on a sphere or you could do three dimensional rotation, all the basics of, um, you know, 3D, you know, textures and stuff like that you can achieve through these image uh, transformation matrices. Um, but there's a couple issues you have to solve. The first problem is, is when you do that, you'll notice that this is the scaling one. We're not going to do scaling anymore. I used to have everyone do rotation and scaling, but we're just going to do rotation. So these top, ignore the bottom ones. The top is the rotation, and you'll notice that when you rotate it, let's say you take the image and you rotate it, I think that's like 45 degrees. You just say 45 degrees. You'll notice that the, um, the image rotates off the screen. And the reason for that is because there's a, the, 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 the pivot point that it's rotating around is the upper left-hand corner. So, you know, it's like, it's, like, it's like only seeing one quadrant, right? You, you miss the other three quadrants. So once you rotate it past 90 degrees, the whole image disappears. You guys with me? So we really want to rotate it around the middle of the screen. Not, we, in other words, we want to set the origin point in the middle. And that's easy. That's easy to do. All you got to do there is, well, it should look like that, right? So if we take this as the image, that's rotated 45 degrees. To do that, you just have to subtract half, half of the width from the column and half of the height from the row before you run it through the equations, right? So this way, if you're at 0, 0, you know, you're doing the first pixel, it's not 0, 0. You just make it negative 160, negative 120 for x and y. Actually, I, sh I should have said those in reverse for, like, 
you know, the, the row would be negative 120 and the column would be negative 160. You guys with me? Right? Then you put it into the transformation matrix and then you add the numbers back. Right? So in other words, you make the correction before you put the transformation, do the transformation, and then d then do the opposite afterwards, and that'll fix that. That'll fix it. You guys with me? That's pretty simple. But the other the other problem is a little bit more nefarious. Notice how I don't know if you can see in the back, but the you notice that this thing looks like um, there's like black dots in there. It looks like a like a screen door, right? The reason for that is because the, you know, I mentioned, you know, the, the row and column is in a, it's an index into an array, right? Indexes are integers, right? But then I said, we're going to do a transformation and we're going to use like sine and cosine. The sine and cosine is going to give you a fractional number between negative one and positive one, which means that after you do the transformation code, you're going to get a fractional row and column. You're going to get a fractional number for the row and column, which then you have to use as an array index? That's not going to work. Array indexes have to be integers. So I rounded them here. I rounded them, I converted to integers, and I rounded them. The problem is you, you get this effect called aliasing when you do that, where when I go through all of these pixels and I find the corresponding, I go through all of these pixels and I find their corresponding location over here, some of those locations are on top of one another, right? And, other, and, and also, going along with that is some of the output locations never get written, right? So you end up with this really weird Swiss cheese looking thing. So we figured out, yeah, there's a zoom, that's what it looks like zoomed in a little bit. So how do we fix it and make it look like that? Um, the way you fix that is Instead of taking, instead of going through each one of these pixels and calculating its corresponding location over here, you do the reverse. You take all of these pixels in the output and you find its corresponding location in the source image. Does, you guys, does that make sense? This part's a little weird. You have to go, instead of going from this to that, now you might say, well, why did you explain it the other way then? Because it's much more, it makes more sense to start with the source, go through all these pixels, and find their location over here. Conceptually, it makes more sense to do that. But what I'm saying now is you can do the reverse. You go through all of these pixels and you find their corresponding input. You go through all the outputs and you find its corresponding input. That way, even if you round fractional numbers, you guarantee that you're going to write all of the output pixels. You might not read all the input pixels, but you'll definitely write all the output pixels. You guys with me? Would it be something what you just said? Wouldn't it the input image before will have some pixels missing? What will happen is, if you do it this way, instead of having missing pixels over here, yeah. you will have inputs that you don't read. So you'll lose input pixels. Oh, it's not actual. So you, you'll have like, in other words, you'll lose quality. You'll lose quality on the output, but at least you'll have all the pixels there. You won't have a Swiss cheese effect, yeah. right? So the next question is, how do you prevent you from losing quality? <laughs> That's the next thing to solve. Um, to do that, you have to use something called interpolation. So instead of rounding Instead of rounding, um, like if, like so after you do the transformation, you'll get a row and column. Like that'll be, say, let's just take something simple. Say 1.5 and 1.5. So in other words, I'm calculating an output pixel, and I know its corresponding input pixel is 1.5, 1.5. Now I could round it to 1, 1, right? But that's not, that's going to give me a really crappy picture. That's not going to look good. So instead, I'm going to think of it this way. If I have 1.5, 1.5, that would mean that my input pixel that I really want is in between four pixels in the image, right? You think of it like the image is quantized. It's, um, it's all of the pixels, oh, sorry, I should say discretized. All of the pixels are at different points, like a grid, 
But when I calculate my transformation, I want an input pixel that doesn't exist because it's in between the grid points. It's in between pixels, right? So how do I, how do I, how do I reconcile that without just picking one of the four? Like if I rounded the number, I would just be picking one of the four pixels. But what I really want is if my input pixel is in between four, I want to create a virtual input pixel that is a mixture of all four, right? It's going to take a mixture of the four surrounding pixels. You guys follow that? Like, what, first of all, why is there four? There's four because we're in two dimensions. If I have a fractional X and a fractional Y, that means that that pixel is inside of four surrounding pixels that are nearest to it, right? So I want to take the color from all four of those pixels and I want to somehow combine it together into one that will represent what I think that in, inside pixel, what color it would be. Now you might say, well, what does that actually do? I mean, what's the effect of that? Well, let's say this is an edge. Let's say that this, th these two pixels are black and these two pixels are white. That happens all the time, right? Like anytime you see an edge like this, like this is gray and white. It's an edge. It's a hard edge. If, if, if I'm trying to calculate a pixel that's right along this edge, then I'm going to calculate a combination of these two colors. I'm going to get like a grayish pixel, right? That way, what will happen is when you rotate that cat picture, I, you know, I don't know if you guys noticed, but like I showed that there's, there's, there's borders on the left and right hand side. There's white and black. When you rotate that cat picture, you'll see an edge of white and black. If you don't interpolate, it's obvious because it creates a sawtooth pattern. But if you interpolate, it creates a nice edge that has grays and, and whites and blacks that make it look more natural, right? So it's really easy to tell if you interpolate. This is called bilinear interpolation. This is the easiest way to interpolate. There's much more accurate ways to do it. But basically the way it works is you just take all four of the pixels and you calculate a weighted average based on how close you are to the four pixels. So what that means is the um, upper left-hand pixel is let's call that I and J, where I and J are the non-fractional part of the result you got from the transformation. Like so if I got 1.5, 1.5, I and J would be 1 and 1. Then you have I, J plus 1, I plus 1, J, and I plus 1, J plus 1. So this guy over here is I, J plus 1, this is I plus 1, J, and this is I plus 1, J plus 1. Right? So you have those four values, and then you calculate four weights where the weights involve the fractional part. So if, you know, if, again, if it was 1.5, 1.5, the fractional part is 0.5. In that case, I'd be right dead middle of those four pixels. Right? So the weight of this follows a bilinear. It's bilinear because there's two dimensions, but it's a linear meaning that I just take I minus the, 1 minus the fractional part of I, 1 minus the fractional part of J, and multiply them together. And that's the weight assigned to that pixel. So then I have four weights, and I just multiply those four weights against the four corresponding pixels and add them up, and I get a, an average that is a mixed value that's in the middle. You guys with me? So it's just a weighted average. Now you might say, well, okay, well, what's so challenging about this? Well, there's a couple of things you got to keep in mind here. One, you have to figure out how to get these, you know, fractional and real parts. I think you guys can figure that out pretty easily. Um, you know, you just use rounding and round the number and subtract it from the original one and that kind of stuff. But there's a couple other things going on. The, the transformation is floating point numbers. And at some point, you have to convert all of this stuff back to integers. So there's some type, type, type casting issues you got to deal with. Also, keep in mind that when you do this weighted calculation, uh, yeah, so here's, a, here's an example here. Let's say I have a, a destination pixel is a mixture of these four. You know, then I just set the destination. I just calculate my weights. But this is a little bit oversimplified, though, because there's, remember, there's three color channels. And so 
you have red, green, and blue. We're doing this in color, not grayscale. So you have to multiply this, this line of this expression would have to be done once for each of the three color channels. So basically, you have four weights with four surrounding pixels, but you have three color channels. So you're probably going to end up with 12 lines of code that, that, that figure all that stuff out. You guys with me? Make sense? This is the most challenging part of the lab. It's just, but it's, it's not a lot of code. It's just tricky code to write. And the other problem, by the way, the hardest part of this is if it doesn't work, if there's a bug, what you're going to see on your screen is just, you know, it, well, it's all going to be scrambled, basically. The problem is, what do you do when that happens? Well, it's, it's tough. I mean, pretty much the only thing you can do is go through the debugger and validate what's happening in every line of code because visually it's going to be hard to figure out what's going on. It's, it's a hard, but, but, but any, any code you write that deals with graphics is like that. You know, you know when it works because it looks right on the screen, but if it doesn't work, it's just like, it looks just like, it's just like static. And then you're trying to, you know, you have to, so you, this is going to be, it, it, it's going to require that you do some, some debugging. Um, okay, so for the next lab, the, the goal is, do I have it pulled up? No. Um, by the way, I, I, I haven't, I forgot to add this to the Dropbox. I'll do this tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, source. Labs. Lab 2. Okay. So this is pretty simple. The description. I get it to come up. Hello. Um. I'll, it's not coming up, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll post it tonight. The objective of Lab 2 is, is really simple. We just want you to read the image and just rotate it in increments of 10 degrees continuously as fast as the processor will do it. 